I have the top of the hour, so let's begin. Let me welcome you, welcome everybody to the Future Trends Forum. I'm delighted to see you all here today. My name is Brian Alexander. I'm the forum's creator. I'm its host. I'm its cat herder for the next hour. And I'm really looking forward to our conversation for a community session today. This is one of our all too rare events where we don't have a guest. In fact, our guest is all of you. The idea here is instead of having uh, one expert, the idea is to share all of our expertise on a particular subject. And this subject is what we are expecting for the year 2022. What do the next 12 months hold for you? What are your hopes? What are your fears? What are your plans? What would you like help with? What would you like networking with? This session is an open mic for you to share all of that. And if you're new to the forum, please know this is a welcoming, warm, and friendly place. We're really here for all of you. Uh, and just to begin with, let me get this slide out of the way. I promised I would. Um, one bit of research I've been working on with a few friends uh, has to do with how campuses are changing their January uh, class efforts. That is, uh, the class is going to be in person or online. Uh, right now, uh, we estimate that nearly 100 American colleges and universities have some or all of their classes online for some or all of January. Sounds like a lot. It's about two and a half percent of the total. There's some leading institutions there, uh, like Stanford, uh, and they're all over the U.S. now, west, south, east, midwest, northeast. Um, but that seems like a minority position. It seems that instead, overall, most colleges and universities are beginning this year with face-to-face -face instruction, with different degrees of PPE, different degrees of social distancing, mediation, and so on. Uh, so just to begin with, I want to put that on the table and say this is a space for you to talk about your coronavirus concerns, plans, hopes, and how you're all doing. Uh, Noah is uh, CU is at Colorado University, um, starting remote for the first two weeks. Uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts. And if, oh, thank you, Noah. That that's really good to know. I can add that to our list if we don't already have that. Uh, that's a really important one. By the way, this research, this is a spreadsheet that is crowdsourced. Uh, we have um, people coming in. Uh, we have a dozen people at a time, it seems like, adding more and more information as we go and as things change and develop. Uh, so I'm what just happened there with one of you suggesting uh, or pointing out a development, uh, that sounds great. Uh, thank you very much. The last thing I had was that um, CU Boulder wouldn't alter its planning. So I'm really grateful to hear that. Thanks. Uh, Tom, if you could share with me a link, uh, that would be good as well. Now, for everybody else, I just put that table on the table right there, and people who seem interested in it. Uh, Diane Deusterhof, um, please, Diane, forgive me for trying to do your Dutch looking name, I'm trying to do it right. Um, St. Mary's has delayed the start of classes. Um, so they're going to be face to face, just not online but delayed. Got it. A lot of campuses are doing that. Uh, Doyle Freston, you mentioned in Kentucky that the public universities are also delaying. Um, they are face to face, not online, but delaying the start of classes. So that's another option uh, to track. Jody Green points out that most University of California um, campuses and more and most California state universities are now starting remote. Jody, what happened to change the CSU frame of mind? Uh, it looked like they began uh, this semester uh, breaking apart from the UCs, uh, trying to have, you know, trying to start late or uh, uh, or to start at a different time. Um, what happened to uh, change their mind? If you want, to, in fact, I can bring you up on stage just so that uh, people don't get to hear from me all the time, um, and you can tell me what you're thinking about. Hello, Jody. Hey, it's good to see you, Brian. It's great um, to see you. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you, too. And yeah, I think a lot of people know that the uh, most of the UCs are on the quarter system. And so uh, we had to make some decisions in December, a little bit ahead of um, other schools. Obviously, Stanford um, is our neighbor here in Santa Cruz, where I'm located. And so we were very aware of their decision. Um, I think it's not entirely well understood why some campuses are making this choice. It's not exactly about safety. 
Um, it, and I see in the public discourse that it's often thought to be you know, like, why can't you just understand that people are not going to get so sick? But it actually has to do with institutional capacity. It has to do with how many isolation beds we have. It has uh, to do with whether we can, if we bring 9,000 people back and then the dining hall workers get sick, uh -huh. how are we going to feed those 9,000 students? Uh -huh. um, and the other thing that really went heavily into our considerations was we really didn't want to start in person and then have large numbers of students unable to attend in person because we think that blended synchronous is not a particularly good way to teach and it's very hard on instructors. And so if you imagine a class where only a, a third to a half of the students could attend in person because the rest of them are in isolation, we wanted to avoid that. Um, so we have started with a two week remote. I think a number of the UCs will be announcing today that they're actually doing the whole month of January. Mm, um, yeah. Some of that depends on whether or not they have a medical center. Um, and it's interesting to me that the CSUs, which of course were very early in announcing that they were going remote uh, for last year, that even though they're on the semester system, uh, we were informed today that most of those campuses have decided to do remote instruction uh, into the first week of February. Um, and I guess the last thing I'll oh. say is, you know, on the West Coast, our, our surge is expected to kind of peak in the third to fourth week of January. So uh -huh. the East uh -huh. Coast schools ha have already maybe had their peak. And so we're also trying to think about if those numbers are really gonna peak uh, at that, you know, not for another week or two, how do we make sure that we don't bring everybody back and try to force an in-person uh, mm. campus when we know that we don't have a medical center or enough medical professionals to take care of everybody in isolation. So, so, so it's safety and institutional capacity, which overlap, but aren't the same things. They're not the same thing. No. And, you know, people keep explaining to me that we're not going to get that sick. And I'm like, I know we're not going to get that sick, but we still have to have enough people. You know, someone, our registrar yesterday said that his husband works for the airlines. And he said, I wish that yeah. universities would learn from what's happening with the airlines that they do not want to try to come back in force and then not have a staff. Uh, to keep the university running. So the airlines are learning that the hard way right now, yeah. uh, as are air travelers. Um, jo by the way, Jody has not only been a great Future Transform guest, uh, you can find her show in, uh, in our archive, uh, but she's also the main instigator of our collaborative spreadsheet. <laughs> um, she's the uh, presiding genius over it, and I'm really grateful to her for, uh, for doing so much organizational and, and leadership work and making that happen. Uh, Jody, can I, can I keep you on stage for a minute and bring up a couple other folks? Yes, because we've got some wonderful people here, even though Tom Hames has just made the brilliantly horrible joke of Omicron dinner parties, um, as in Donner parties, rather. Um, but let's uh, I want to add uh, a Canadian friend, um, uh, Mathieu Plourde, uh, coming to us from Quebec. Uh, and Mathieu mentioned that University of Laval is starting online. But also, Mathieu, from, from what I can tell, it looks like a whole bunch of Canadian universities uh, are starting online. Uh, what's, yeah, absolutely. What's the Canadian thinking here? Is it the same or is there something different going on? I think that it's kind of a, um, it's mostly hospitals that are struggling. Like uh, we're struggling with the surge and then other provinces, since all the institutions are public in, in Canada, a lot of like basically they got, they got guidelines that they have to shut down. Um, because even if Omicron is not as bad in terms of hospitalization than the, like the severity of the cases, you're still they're still struggling with understaffing in the, uh, the health system. Also, a lot of the people in the health system have Omicron and can't pr go to work. And now we're, we start we're starting to actually see um, like the guidelines for five days isolation instead of 10 and that kind of stuff. So they want to get people oh, wow. back. In, in their workplace as, as fast as possible. So we're following the same guidelines as the CDC a couple of days ago and stuff like that. So uh, because we're understaffed like all over the place, it's, 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 that's basically the, what's guiding everything around what we're doing with, um, with the school closures and the online uh, remote stuff and whatever. Now, when you say we are moving to uh, the uh, five day um, lockdown instead of the 10, is that just Quebec or is it the whole nation? I think that every province has their own guidelines when it comes to, because the healthcare is actually provincial. Mm -hmm. So uh, it really depends on, you know, what every province is going to decide. But in Quebec, the, um, they're, they're, they're looking at it. I don't know if it's, it was announced or whatever. I know they were looking at it. Uh, but then um, we're basically in, 
we have a curfew. We can't have people in our, okay. uh, we can't invite people in our houses. Hmm. Uh, we have, uh, we have a curfew at 10 PM in Quebec. So hmm. people can't be on the road between 10 PM and 5 AM. Uh, so hmm. we're, uh, we're pretty much back to what we were. They were, they're actually even closing all the businesses on Sundays to give people a break and stuff like that. It's, uh, hmm. it's pretty severe. So, well, first of all, please be safe. Um, mm -hmm. Take care of yourself. Uh, Jody, this sounds like another instance uh, or adding to the idea of, of capacity. In this case, it's not just the university mm -hmm. capacity, but also the general healthcare capacity. Uh, yes, we're... totally. I mean, we have a, in the Kaiser system in the Bay Area, we have a 41% positivity rate for symptomatic folks, uh, at least a 17 to 20% positivity rate for asymptomatic folks. And I just heard from a dear friend who works in public health epidemiology that at least one ER is going to have to close uh, for five days um, because so many people have COVID. What? So, Closing um, ER? Yeah. Oh, my so, God. Yeah. Wow. Um, and the... the oh. Well, thank you. Thank you both for sharing this. I, I don't mean, yay, that's that's happy news. But I mean, this, <laughs> this is important. Uh, we need to know this as we're as we're making decisions and as we're walking through this um, in the in the chat, we've had um, uh, a few different comments. Tiffany uh, McLennan says every Nova Scotian university is starting online, most until uh, January 25 or 30. Uh, John Hollenbeck says his son at York is 50 50 live online. Uh, which is another in, another way of approaching this. Uh, mm -hmm. so we've got quite a few different institutional strategies, it seems, right now. And um, Brian, I, I would just also say for quarter schools in the U.S., just, just so that the full range of what the considerations are are well understood, we have a holiday in the U.S. Uh, on um, January 17th. We have a yeah. three-day weekend. Yeah. And so there was also a concern that if folks traveled, for if students primarily traveled for the three day weekend, that we would just start the wave of infections again. And so another part of the, initially we had wanted the students to come back right at the start of January. And then we'd have two weeks to kind of get them tested and get them through any little surge. But then when we realized they would, many of them would go away at the end of that two weeks for the MLK weekend, um, it seemed better to bring them back uh, around the 24th of January and then try to get started on the 31st. Well, this is and this is coming after the winter travel season uh, where um, now just just to be clear, uh, Mathieu and Jody, you're talking about uh, uh, cases and uh, you're, you're speaking about infections right now uh, when you're talking about rising numbers. Uh, you're, I mean, the hospitalizations the, are a big concern in Quebec. It's not it's not even the infections. They basically given up on on PCR testing. They just said, you know, we're just keeping those for. The healthcare workers and the vulnerable populations, like the old people, old folks, and stuff like that. Everybody else is just use the rapid tests and and self isolate, and you don't even have to report. So most of the numbers that are reported are pro probably like um, it's probably three or four times, you know, uh, more people that are getting infected than what the reports are saying. Well, this yeah. is uh, th it's pretty pretty. It's just it's too early for us yet to know about what's going to happen with hospitalizations. We've really just started uh, the Omicron rise on the West Coast, um, although that 41 percent is uh, telling us that we're getting into it here. Um, but New York, I noticed, is going up by about 400 hospitalizations a day. And so that tells us that it's not this is not a benign uh, disease for some people, although it will be benign for many of us. Um, yeah, also a really interesting thing out of the Mayo Clinic yesterday about people who are only uh, test positive for 48 hours um, and that that's a completely new wrinkle to this. Hmm. Well, this is uh, there's, there's a lot of data here that we have to uh, that we have to work through. Uh, there's a lot of data that we have to grapple with and a lot of it is just emerging and often uh, uh, perceived through a, a, a pretty wide range of, uh, of lenses that aren't always reliable. Uh, it's really important to be able to have, uh, for us to keep, keep our eye on all of this very carefully. Uh, I just threw in the chat, um, there's a link to a, a page I've been maintaining for a couple of years on resources for tracking uh, data on this. Um, but just to just to remind everybody, we're at the stage where Omicron is on a per case basis, seems to be less likely to cause tissue damage, death, uh, than its previous strains. On the other hand, it's much more infectious. So we have this interesting 
case where depending on how these numbers work out, we may see a greater surge overall of hospitalizations and deaths. This is still early and we're still trying to model this. Uh, in, in the chat, uh, a couple of people have asked about uh, mapping this, and I thought I would just quickly show you this. Uh, this is a very DIY um, uh, object you're about to look at. And here, let me just put this. Uh, on the uh, this is a, a, a quick uh, Google map of uh, all the uh, colleges and universities in the United States and Canada that have uh, closed, uh, or, I'm sorry, that have classes online. Um, it's incomplete right now. It's behind a couple of days. Uh, and the Canadian one is woefully incomplete. That's just a question of uh, me getting time to hit copy and paste and, and save. Um, but you can see that it's already now pretty widespread um, within the U.S. You can see the Northeast, the Midwest, and the Southeast uh, all have instances, and the West Coast in particular. Uh, you can see Hawaii, too, because the University of Hawaii is there. Um, at a more ambitious level, I tried to map this onto Google Earth, uh, so that, that looks a little more uh, lovely, uh, but you can still see the, uh, the spread of, of light blue dots uh, across all of that. Uh, so thank you for the question, and uh, we'll keep updating that uh, as we go. Um, there have been more questions that have come up, and uh, I want to make sure people get a chance to uh, to ask them. Uh, and, you know, Tom Hames does this thing where he puts in a question, and then I just say, I'm not going to listen to your question. I'm going to bring you up on stage uh, because you're off, awesome, and we need to hear from you. Hello, Tom. Good afternoon or morning, wherever you happen to be. Um, <clears throat> So uh, I, but but my question is a bit of a of a uh, topic switch. Uh, instead of the uh, the firefighting here and now, uh, I was curious, um, looking forward, whether anybody was seeing any kind of interesting um, class modalities, class uh, structures that have come in a post pandemic world, things like uh, shortened terms. Uh, Amorphous terms, uh, uh, fluid, uh, fluid uh, moving from in person to online, those kind of things. I'm just kind of curious, what do you think has changed at your institution? I'm, I'm throwing this open to everybody in the group. You know, what yeah. do you think has changed in your institution in terms of how we view what a course of study actually is in this environment and, and going forward? As yeah, a result I can of do it quick a quick answer and then I'll get off the stage because other people should get up here. But thanks a lot for raising that question, Tom. And one thing that we've we've seen a lot more interest from students in online offerings. And one thing that we're really thinking about is how can we sort of um, get engagement at the including from students and residents. So how can we use the first week of the term to possibly have them meet in person? And my colleague Michael Tassio is here who knows much more about this than I do. But use engagement in the beginning of the term. We saw real increases in the outcomes in a course where we had students come in person at the beginning and then have a relationship with their instructors and then be mm -hmm. online. This is particularly critical for early career courses. I will say um, as my Parthian shot that the biggest concern that we have right now is how are we going to language to students that we are an in-person university except when they're taking actual online classes and that we can't <laughs> offer remote attendance in in-person courses because we now have a lot of students who want to attend in-person classes remotely and we just i just don't think we are we collectively are there yet i don't think mm -hmm. that the design principles. I don't think we have the technology. I don't think we have the faculty remuneration. Um, I don't think we have anything in place. And yet students and their families are absolutely wanting to be able to phone it in. Um, so I'll leave that one on the table. <laughs> well, I mean, the, the, the flip side of that with some students is that they don't have the technology uh, and and that that's that is an ongoing that's been an ongoing struggle throughout remote teaching. So I mean, you can't forget that either at a lot of institutions. I teach at a community college, so that's really the bigger fight there. Yeah, I hear that. Maybe if I, if I can add to that, um, I've just had a couple of conversations recently with some faculty that are going to be starting that that you know flipped remote uh, emergency remote uh, semester, and basically they're asking why. You know, if I was supposed to teach in class and I'm going to start the first three weeks remotely and I just keep going remotely, 
You know, people are going to say that. And it's like, because yeah. they always have, we always have students who are going to are going to make the chance, the, the, yeah. the decision not to show up anyway. So why can't mm -hmm. you just keep going? So I feel like, um, like faculty are also going to see that, you know, doing high flex and going in the classroom is not, it's not, you know, going to give them that much. But at the same time, it's like, it's basically, it's always the same problem with a lot of these things. It's the people who have done the most effort to, um, to deploy good pedagogy that are actually going to be punished by this. Because people who have used the face-to-face -face class to do a real, real interesting experience where there's a lot of engagement, a lot of stuff like that. That's when, you, when you try to translate that into an online course. That's where that where, that's where it fails. So you get basically our first, our our good teachers are the ones who are getting kind of um, cornered by this because now they're asked to do something that's like in between. That's like the the worst of both worlds when you're doing high flex, and and they you know trying to figure out are you keep engagement when you have half of your class in class and half of your class online is just it's just really a lot of a lot of work and you have to do the you have to do the work twice yep. um, and people mm -hmm. are not prepared for that so to me that's the big problem but um, i think that a long a long um, long term um, maybe strategy is going to be diversification you know we we've been talking about the adult learner forever but you know now we really have to figure out what is going to be our course offering? Who's our target audience? And are we targeting the adult learners for real? Are we giving the non-credit space, the you know, the space it needs? Because every institution is going to have to basically just scrape by and try to find a little piece here and there to actually, you know, have enough revenue uh, to mm -hmm. make it work. So I think that um, that's the kind of stuff we're, we're seeing. I, I've moved, I've changed job. I work for the College of Business now, and I'm going to be working a lot on non-credit. I'm the first instructional designer who was, was actually hired to work uh, a part of his job on non-credit for the College of Business. Right. So we're um, so I think we're going to see a lot of that stuff because it's like it's like anything else that, you know, it's about managing risk. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. No, I mean, I think one, one of the Sorry, things Tom, we struggle with is. Yeah, yeah go, go ahead. Yeah, um, yeah. One of the things we struggle with is is rigid definitions. This is an online course. Therefore, it's like this. Uh -huh. This is an in-person mm -hmm. course. Therefore, it's like this. This is a hybrid course, therefore it's like this. And, you know, it, it, I've, it's been my experience. There's certain things that work better online. There's certain things that work better in person. I like to mix and match that in a way that benefits my students. Um, and, um, but there's really no clear definition of what that means in my institution. It's not hybrid, it's not 50-50. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, I, it, it's whatever the students need in order to succeed. That's really what it's come boils down to. And, and just thinking of it in terms of the more traditional way of the way we think about it, this is a special class because it's online. Um, that kind of needs to, I think that needs to shift. I think we need to talk about modalities when people are available to learn um, asynchronous versus synchronous, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Those are the kind of things we need to be talking about. And those definitions aren't out there. And I'm just wondering if, if anybody's, creating some creative definitions as a result of all of this toggle terming. Right? We have a glossary. I mean, we have to have a glossary because of both yeah. regional predator and uh, academic Senate rules. Right. And so we have actually developed, Michael and I, and I think Michael's still here, quite a sophisticated vocabulary. And we even have something called emergency remote attendance now, which means attending an in-person, when we thought we would be fully in-person, Right. It was acknowledging that some students who are trying to graduate cannot or will not return. And so it's a way in which they are allowed to attend an in-person mm -hmm. class remotely, but there is no guarantee that the class will be redesigned for them. So it's not a blended synchronous class that was intentionally designed. And that is the kind of fine, that is the fineness wow. with which we're having to slice things. Um, mm -hmm. I think, you know, one thing that we always have to keep reminding everyone, you know, with some of the stuff that people are saying in the chat about people, about parents and remote instruction is, yeah. you know, at least when a class is online, it's had some intentional design that's gone into it. Mm -hmm. right? Most of our in-person classes were not intentionally designed prior to the pandemic. And so I think we have raised the bar on, the, on both help-seeking behavior and intentional design. Um, mm -hmm. and I think we are beginning to help. I think we are beginning to get the message out that pandemic era 
instruction should not be used as a referendum on remote modalities. That there's a great thread in Twitter that some of you may have seen by a student, actually, that's been circulating in the last couple of days. It says remote instruction is not the problem. That's not where we have mental health challenges. We have mental health challenges because we're trying to survive a pandemic. And um, I think, you know, that bears repeating because there's still people trying mm -hmm. to extrapolate from what happened during a pandemic about the benefits or lack thereof of remote instruction, which is ridiculous. Uh, yeah, this is I, I think this is a fantastic uh, turn uh, that we're taking this conversation. Uh, Jody, I'm going to follow your, your kind wishes and boot you off the stage. And I'm going to let uh, Mathieu go back and enjoy the precious few hours of daylight he's got in the, in the, the North Country. Um, and I want to just drive in a, a bit more on this question of, uh, of, how we're, uh, of how we're mutating and how we're changing, how we're developing new vocabulary, how we're developing new practices, uh, how we have new programs and new designs. Uh, and we had a question about this uh, from a wonderful personal hero of mine, David Scobie, who's been a guest before. He's the leader of Bring Theory to Practice. And I wanted to bring him on because he's building on, uh, on Tom's question. Hello, David. Hey, Brian and Tom and everyone. Good, Good to see you. Um, hey. Uh, I, the comment I put in chat was prompted by Tom's question because it connected to something that is one of my own pet obsessions, which is the value of breaking out of the semester quarter credit hour uh, ecology, which is good for allocating labor, but in my view, not good for learning. And I, I've, I've long thought if we could design uh, academic calendars that mix long, longer form team-based learning with short modular skill transfer experiences, neither of which is handled well by the semester, uh, that would be really valuable. And there have been some experiments uh, with that. But Tom's question made me wonder uh, if the pandemic was opening up opportunities or experiments uh, or mashups there in the same way that it has been doing with these, these issues of modality that we've just been talking about. Mm -hmm. I, heard that and, and your your question made me see that <clears throat> the discussion about hybrid high flex remote in person could touches on these questions of how time the time of learning can be reshaped so mm -hmm. i don't have an answer but i do have a question uh, it's a great <laughs> question um and we've been uh, for a couple of years and you know you can't cough or sneeze innocently in this time Please be safe, David. Please, oh, God. Um, the uh, ha has anybody here seen any instances of this? Um, have you seen any mashups or uh, alterations? Uh, just to give you a bit more fodder for thinking about this, uh, Jody um, was very, very right to insist on the difference between quarter and semester schedules for responding immediately to uh, Omicron. Uh, has anybody been blending this, uh, David? I'm thinking of the. Um, of the shift from semesters to quarters or blocks that a few small colleges have been doing. Um, so instead of uh, say 12, 13, 14 week uh, semesters, they've shifted down to eight, seven, six week terms in order to be more flexible. Um, we've, we've done a set, that's, that's one that comes to mind. Um, I, I, I can't hear from, uh, from everybody else. Uh, yeah. Everybody else is saying, yeah, this is a great idea. Um, I, I so, so, sorry. No, so no, uh, no. Uh, in response to your question, uh, David, is, um, I can't bend the 16 week semester or however oh. long semester that I happen to be teaching in. But uh, what I have been able to do with remote teaching is bend time within that structure. In other words, uh, you know, I've had breaking up the class into smaller groups that only meet for shorter bursts of time. I've had entire weeks where I've basically said, OK, we're going to meet individually. I'm going to go through the entire class and everybody's going to talk to me for 15 minutes. And these are things that are logistically a lot easier to do uh, remotely. You know, you, you just turn on a Zoom session and you're, go, you're good to go. So in that way, I have been able to bend time. I mean, that overall 16-week clock doesn't stop, but some students need more time 
within that 16 week time frame to get to the same place as the other students do. And I've tried to accommodate that as much as possible. And remote teaching has actually helped that. Um, but, uh, you know, I obviously there's some students that are not going to get there in 16 weeks is the other problem. Let me you know. And we've had a lot of disruption outside of class, too. That's a big problem. People getting sick, uh, people's families getting sick, missing a month of class and then expecting to somehow play catch up is is really tough. Brian, if I could quickly piggyback on that. Um, I, my own experience, as Brian knows, in, in both in community-based, project-based teaching, and also in, in supervising CAPS, you know, history senior thesis seminars, in both of those, uh, a lot of the semester can be much more flexibly used for individualized work uh in in ways that 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 dock with what that rhyme with what you're talking about uh, about um going to remote but i but i also want to push for longer term uh, i, I mm -hmm. actually don't love the mm. the making shorter you know the kind of colorado college you know mm -hmm. nine week unit uh the 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 most important <laughs> one it seems to me the most creative work we've done in the world of civic and community engaged learning is to figure out how to kind of staple together different semesters and summer experiences in longer mm. arcs of team-based learning. Uh, and so in addition to all the creative ways you've kind of hacked the semester, I, I think we need to, uh, to develop a mix of, of much shorter and much longer opportunities for students to work. Right. Um, I agree with that 110 percent. It's uh, as a fact as an adjunct faculty member, I, I don't have the ability to uh, to uh, more uh, to massage the term. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to do what I can as, in that respect. I hear you. We, we've got some uh, some responses. And by the way, um, if, if you'd like uh, if you're using the chat, if you'd like to type in something that you want everybody to see, uh, use the Q&A box. And so I can I can flash that on the screen. Uh, Julie uh, Metzger mentions Evergreen's alternative format, uh, which has uh, uh, multiple quarter sequences. Uh, Pam Mack mentions a frustration that they can offer now uh, half and a quarter special courses, but most departments don't offer any of those. Um, that uh, Let's see, Purdue was thinking of adopting a J term, still getting back to the smaller <clears throat> scale, uh, but there was some pushback about that. Um, and Mark, uh, who's been asking great questions the entire time, um, has asked, uh, what are, why are some courses not intensive and long and others like literature and poetry which take more time to digest? It's a great foundational question. Um, uh, I, I think, um, uh, it may be that the pandemic has pushed us into an emergency mode, David, forcing us to short-term thinking. Yeah. Um, and that the, the instinct is to kind of, you know, shorten and be more flexible, uh, and, and not to extend, but, um, but I, I think this is terrific. I'm not seeing any any uh, other examples, uh, so I'm glad that you've just put a stake in the ground here to ask us to think about that. Bennington uh, is the only other one that I know of uh, with a year long, a little bit like the way that the Evergreen um, sequences. Uh, which uh, one? Uh, which which campus was that? Sorry, Bennington College. Bennington. Yep, very good. Um, well, this is a great, a great idea, um, and we'll put this out there. So we'll see if anybody else thinks about this. Thank you, thank you, David. Can can I keep you up here for another minute? Uh, course, if yeah, if sure. it won't drain you too, I, I don't want you to, you know, be uh, sapped by being on, on on stage with us. Um, we've had a lot of, of comments that have been flowing through the uh, uh, through the screen with a lot of different uh, points and a lot of experience. Um, Rich Golden, uh, I'm sorry, Rich Schultz, the founder of Golden, um, has a, a really good question I want to bring up. If designed properly with forethought, true online classes can be flexible for student work. Is anyone teaching in a similar format to MOOCs where students have much time to meet learning outcomes? Well, this is a great question. I guess MOOCs would be one case of that, Rich. Um, and it'd be interesting to check out MOOC enrollment numbers to see uh, how they're doing uh, this year. Um, uh, during the pandemic. Um, but is anybody else doing that? Is anybody else shifting to uh, that kind of uh, more learner-centered, flexible timeline uh, schedule? So that's another question to keep up. 
Thank you, Rich. Uh, I'll monitor for that. Um, well, we have we have all of this here thinking about about the coronavirus, thinking about strategically and thinking about it personally. And I just have to repeat for everybody who's here, my heart goes out to, for all of you. Looking at all the stories I'm hearing in the chat, from all the exhaustion, the burnout, the stress, the worry, the anxiety, the fear. I'm 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 sorry for all of you, and I support all of you. And I want to make sure that you can come out of this as best you can, uh, and we're here to help as best we can too. Um, we have uh, uh, Tom just shared a, a blog post he just did, uh, and Jody adds that uh, in many public systems, the intense pressure to decrease time to degree works in the opposite direction from what you're asking for there. Um, uh, that's a good problem, a good point. Uh, Randall um, uh, shares another link. There's a bunch of links in the chat here, by the way, which are really, really useful. Uh, shares a link about his notes on benefits of online versus in-person and how to use those benefits of online course design. Thanks, Randall. Good stuff. Uh, Mark adds that in California, Southern, Univer Southern California University teaches PhDs and gives them all the time they need to get the learning objectives, and then they can move on to the next module. Mark, was that a, a, a COVID era a development, or did that predate? Um, uh, the pandemic. And then uh, Robert mentions uh, alternatives to Zoom. Thanks, Robert. Always looking for that. Using one right here, right now. Uh, so glad to hear it. Brian, could I? Please. I, didn't, I don't want to derail you from where you were going, but uh, a question, a thought came up in response to these last several comments. Um, the uh, I think it was Rich Schultz's comment and several of the others are taught, you know, talked about the individual flexibility and kind of customization of time with, with um, um, more competency-based and more asynchronous learning. And I get that that's a power of breaking open the time um, constraints, but I'm equally committed to the way in which new schedules cre help create opportunities for team-based and collaborative learning. And I really worry about the kind of um, isolationism of that's, that's one set of outcomes to what yeah. Rich and others were talking about. So I'm interested in people's thoughts about where this kind of flexible and asynchronous learning can be married with um, collaborative and team-based learning. Ah, uh, that's a big, big reach. Um, that's a great point about that. Learner centered can become learner isolated. Yeah. Uh, and for a mm -hmm. lot of us, we either we we see higher education having a major socialization function, um, and that may be for civic uh, engagement, that may be for preparation for the workforce. Uh, and right now, it's also kind of re-socializing after the pandemic, after a lot of traditional age students have lost their socialization opportunities uh, to some degree. Um, so we need to have that uh, uh, as, as something to consider. By the way, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm conscious of time, and I, I want to make sure that everyone gets a chance to bring something up. Uh, David, Tom, let me let you guys have a, a rest. Let me let you uh, go down. And uh, I want to bring up um, uh, Joseph, uh, because Joseph has pointed out something else since we're talking about technology. Uh, and I, I think this is, this is an important one to bring up. Uh, and he has a different technology that he's using. And because he has a great beard, I want to hear from him. No, because this is an important point. Joseph, hello. Hi, this is the apprentice beard. <clears throat> <laughs> no, that's a mighty beard, my friend. Um, so, um, yeah, I've been using Discord for the last few terms. Um, I looked around at the beginning when, when Canvas was kind of failing me and um, asked who is using really good technology to communicate over distance. And I thought about the gamer community, which is where Discord came from. I actually went in search of uh, TeamSpeak, but that doesn't really help very much. But Discord has absolutely everything I need in it to facilitate communication among uh, class. I teach technical writing and business writing and um, multimodality. And um, in that setting, um, they can video chat, they can, I can arrange it so that they're in teams and have their own private rooms to talk about or anything they need to talk about uh, as a team in there. Um, sometimes uh, they 
do like to go form their own modes of communication. But every time I find out about that, I just throw them the privacy policy of whatever it is they're using, oh. and they usually come back. Yeah. <laughs> privacy. That's a, that's an interesting move. That's an interesting move. Uh, just quickly, anybody else using uh, Discord? And, and before I get to ask that question, we're already answering it for me. Uh, Lisa Durf, who is a hardcore power user, talks about using Second Life and Discord at the same time, which seems to be frying her hardware. I can see that. Uh, John Hollenbeck is doing a Kimbo in Discord. I'm not sure what that means, um, but uh, but it uh, sounds like a positive one. Uh, Noah Geisel, I hope it's Geisel. Sorry, Noah, um, is uh, embracing students' use of it. Uh, it's great for classroom engagement uh, and community. Students really get into it, start making stuff. Um, so that's good to hear. Um, uh, Pam Mack mentioned the students seem to use GroupMe for shadow courses. Pam, what, what's a shadow course, and uh, how does GroupMe work for that? Um, Sarah would love to use Discord. Um, and, uh, and there's another, oh, uh, Jody Green points out a UCSC uh, authored article on uh, using Discord as a class server. Thank you. Uh, I think I've read that, and it's a good piece. Um, Ah, John Holbeck is talking about Seth Godin's learning platform, which I, I don't know. That's that's new to me. Um, and Amelia mentions using uh, Teams as a hub. And Joseph, you just turned over a big rock with a lot yeah. of <laughs> with it. I'd like to say one more thing about GroupMe before um, this is this is the one real problem that I've been encountering with a lot of this technology is the the privacy and the amount of personal data you have to surrender in order to become part participant. Uh, GroupMe is one of the ones that you actually have to give your cell phone number to in order to participate. And um, some of the other ones like Discord, they don't do that. You can use your school email to sign up and have a completely autonomous account that's separate from your personal life. It's it's a lot, um, a lot more uh, desirable for me to teach that way. The only thing with the privacy there is I have to uh, refrain from going into their private rooms and looking into the, what what they're talking about, and and I promise to do that at the beginning of the term, every term, and and so far I've been able to keep to it, except for when I'm called in there to settle a dispute. That's it. Oh, that's tricky. Mm -hmm. That's tricky. It is. But if and if and if if they bring you in there in a mediating role, then it's fair for you to come in. Yeah, I tell them I won't only come if asked. Very nice. Very nice. Uh, well, this is this is interesting. It may be that um, I mean, just if we talk about uh, Zoom University, um, and that's, that's kind of become the the avatar of, of uh, online instruction during the pandemic. It may be that we're also seeing a whole series of other tools really pop up that deserve a lot of attention, and and one of them is Discord. Thank you, thank you, Joseph. And uh, by the way, enjoy the winter that's down there. I hope you don't get too much snow. Just a little bit. I like Huntsville a lot. See you soon, Joseph. Bye. Um, and we've we've had a rich discussion uh, coming through um, the chat, but also here on stage, we've had uh, a really, really great range of, of topics and points. Um, and I want to bring up, um, uh, if I can, uh, Pam Mack uh, from uh, Clemson University. Um, uh, Pam asked a question about, a, or I asked her a question rather about terms she used. I want to give her a chance to unfold this a little bit because this may be another sign of academic innovation in the threat of this crisis. Hello, Pam. Hi. You, can you hear me? We can see and hear you, and both are great. Excellent. So this is something I believe, at least at Clemson, students invented. Uh, and invented particularly with the beginning of emergency remote instruction, they started forming group me groups for their classes, not including the instructor. Ah. And those groups give, they give each other hints. So I had a class at one point where with the help of teaching assistants, I was running two groups at the same time. And then I'd moved to an, another two groups. Uh, and if I called on people in the first part, the students in the, in the other group would be all prepared to be called on because clearly in the group me, they'd been warned that I was calling on people that day. Oh, wow. But wow. they also have shared, there was a case, another faculty member who had an essay assignment gave the gave some questions in advance some student 
looked up an answer on a cheating site and shared it on GroupMe. Uh -huh. And lots of students gave pretty much the same answer to the essay exam. And it was a bad answer to start with. That's always a problem with cheating, copying off the wrong thing, right? Yeah. Um, but people, I think two thoughts out of this. One is, yeah. what are the students inventing? Uh -huh. And the uh -huh. other is just to be aware of this shadow course thing that's going on at some places. Well, those are two very, very important points. Uh, and we haven't, we haven't talked about them yet today. Um, and, and they're both really important to see. Uh, in fact, someone, I don't know if you saw this in the chat, Pam, someone was talking about how in their class Discord, the students who are inventing new stuff. They're inventing points and features in the game. So that's a good example of that. Uh, but then also, as Dave Scobie just said, this is the dangers of student collaboration. This is the, the negative side of it. Um, but these things these things are occurring. Uh, this is really important. Thank you, Pam. Thank you. And uh, stay warm down there, too. <laughs> yeah, we got a little cold weather in South Carolina. Just a touch for you guys, yes. Good to see you. Uh, we have um, uh, a whole bunch of, uh, of comments that have come in, and I want to bring uh, one more up. Um, uh, this is coming from um, Rich Schultz. Um, I got his name correctly this time. Uh, and Rich asks us to rethink some of these things. Uh, that hybrid and blended are two terms that are changing with time. Asynchronous with synchronous elements versus face-to-face -face remote. Which is blended? Which is hybrid? Why? Uh, Rich, this reminds me of Jody's comments about the new terms they're having, which was uh, Jody was this emergency remote attendance, I think, um, that we're, we're developing a whole ontology or a whole vocabulary uh, in response to all this, which may both reflect and drive uh, some of the changes. Um, so thank you. Uh, thank you very much for sharing that. Um, we have a, a, a few more comments and a few more ideas. Um, Sarah San Gregorio mentions WhatsApp. Uh, her doctoral class is using that for cohort and uh, as individual classes, and as she says, it can be used for good. Uh, John Hollenbeck gives us uh, another view on uh, student cheating or negative collaboration, which is that plagiarism is to be praised. It keeps us honest as teachers. Um, and speaking of terms, Lisa asks us to think about learning, uh, which is very, very good. Um, and then I mentioned a glossary, and Jody already has a glossary. My God, I'm just behind the times. Um, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, I'd like to um, ask a couple of questions for all of you right now as the uh, as your host and as your cat herder for the uh, for the forum. Uh, uh, to start with a request, uh, if you uh, learn of any cases of campuses moving online this month, um, if you hear of them starting remote instruction uh, or shifting online in a hurry, doing what I call the toggle term, uh, please, please let us know. Uh, put it in the uh, in the uh, spreadsheet or contact me directly uh, or contact Jody directly. Um, but it would be great to keep up uh, and to keep that resource going because uh, it's right now the best one out there. Um, I want to uh, then ask you also, looking ahead to 2022, on the face of it, our discussion today shows that we are all very, very concerned about the pandemic and what that does to higher education, and how we respond. And then under that response, we have a whole series of different directions and topics, everything from academic honesty to structuring the timeline of classes to questions of credit to questions of exhaustion and uh, faculty workload and staff support. Um, and then Mark DeFusco reminds us that uh, a lot of these institutions are also fragile uh, and uh, some of them may not survive this year. What I'd like to ask is, what would you like us to cover uh, on the forum over the next year? What are some of the topics that you'd like us to really zero in on? Uh, I can try to hunt good guests for each of them. And of course, I'm always looking to hear more of them from, from you all. But what are the topics that you'd like us to think of based on what you're thinking right now? So there's that moment of quiet where everyone scratches their head, thinks about it. And again, don't be shy. Uh, respond to all of you because this is a forum for all of you um, to support your ideas and where you'd like to go. Uh, Lisa asks us to pray the local college would go online instead of bringing us more virus from Baltimore. 
Why Baltimore in particular, Lisa? Um, um, Pam uh, brings up the question of, uh, Pam, if I may, of exhaustion. I think it's hard for us to keep enthusiasm up for trying new things as this stretches on. Uh, I hear that. And that may be a topic that we need to really dive into or return to. Um, Ayala Moore uh, asks about uh, that on their campus, their mantra is preparing students for the real world, which suggests we will know what the real world is, what it will be. How deeply held is this notion of the real world? How helpful? How accurate? Good question. Good question. Uh, I've done in the past uh, a few different workshops and open sessions that are uh, what we've nicknamed the future of everything, uh, where we'll have people talking about the future of work, the future of media, the future of food, the future of governments. Uh, it may be that doing a series like that might be something that would be uh, useful. Uh, Jody asks us to think about competency-based education. Um, we really should do that. I don't think we've had a session on CBE yet. Uh, Lisa asks us to think about culturally relevant pedagogy, uh, which is a really, really good idea. And Lisa, if you have a, a, a speaker in mind uh, or a guest, please let me know. Uh, Greg thinks that this session is either so good or just so appropriate that we should do it uh, every three months. Thank you, Greg. Uh, happy to do that. Um, Marcus uh, points, or sorry, Mark DeFusco points out that stimulus money saved many colleges. Not sure there'll be any more stimulus this year. Uh, Mark, I'm not seeing any stimulus money coming from the feds this year. The feds can barely get things going at all right now. Uh, so I think that's going to be a, a source of some stress. Lisa, thank you for answering my question. Uh, Rich Schultz has a topic idea, how to move from emergency remote teaching uh, to, whoops, excuse me. I just lost that screen there, uh, to remove from emergency remote teaching to true online learning. Uh, good question. And then the metaverse. Uh, we have a couple of sessions in the works for the metaverse. Uh, so very briefly, I'm trying to approach that with as little hype and uh, and buzz as possible to think about it very clearly and practically. Uh, so we have some speakers lined up to talk about the VR side of it. I'm looking for speakers as well to talk about either the uh, blockchain Bitcoin um, uh, side of it, or also the Facebook side. So if you have anybody, that, that would be great. Uh, Sarah has the great resignation in mind. Sarah, I, I would love to talk about this. Uh, I would love to host someone on this. The thing is, I'm just hearing all kinds of contradictory data and ideas about it. Maybe maybe a panel would be good to have a few different people. It's, a, it's an important topic. Uh, Alex um, asks, or, or I'm going to try this, Alex uh, Zazitabol uh, Borisairo. Oh, I'm Alex. I probably massacred that. My apologies. Uh, Kim wants us to talk about flex work policies. We had a session on that, and that would be good. Um, and David is really interested in student engagement with exhaustion, uh, with politics under conditions of polarization. Uh, that's a very, that's a lot to talk about, uh, actually. That's a very, very deep one. Uh, John likes the future of work idea. Uh, Heather McGowan gave a talk. Oh, good. John, if you know her, um, let me know. Otherwise, I can just cold call her. I'm shameless about that. Uh, Noah thinks is thinking a lot about how we can equip students with learning records that are made to be consumed in the real world. So that's a really good point. Noah, do you know our, our guest and longtime friend, Phil Long? He's been working on some projects along these lines. Um, Mathieu wants to see institutions that have done the work of positioning themselves with regards to modalities. Uh, learning modalities, Mathieu? Um, and then Joseph Robert Shaw? Uh, who is still recovering from being on stage, uh, wants us to uh, think about, let me put this up here so you can see it, um, what's happening in administration? How is the university accumulating power and removing department leadership as a result of the pandemic? So uh, if we have emergency uh, organization, to what extent is that overriding, say, faculty governance or, or um, uh, consideration on campus? Good question, Joseph. Uh, Joe wants to know about the new normal on campus. And Marty wants to know about the most relevant and existing and new educator competencies that are related to these new and emerging modalities. Uh, this is terrific, friends. Uh, this is a great, great list. Thank you all uh, for sharing this. We are right now again at the top of the hour, which means I have to wrap things up. Uh, let me thank you all, first of all, for answering my question so generously with all these ideas, but also thank you for coming together today. Uh, we, we've sat around the virtual fire, we've shared our, our fears, our anxieties, our hopes, uh, some of our aspirations, 
And also we've pooled our thoughts together. We've put together a lot of different uh, ideas about what we'd like to accomplish. I'm really grateful to you for, for doing all of that. And we can do more of this uh, if you'd like. Uh, looking ahead, just want to remind you, we have a whole series of sessions coming up on a wide range of topics. We uh, also are happy to keep talking about this uh, on Twitter or on, on my blog. Uh, we're also always happy to point you to our giant archive of sessions, which have touched on a lot of these topics in the past. And above all, I'd like to make sure that as you dive into 2022, that all of you take care of yourselves, that you are safe physically and mentally, that you're able to keep doing all this great work within higher education. And I hope that here at the forum that we can serve as a venue for you to think about and work together as we apprehend the future of higher education. Take care of yourselves, friends. We'll see you next time online. Bye-bye.